series called The Road to Recovery, which is really about how we can focus on the ministry of Celebrate Recovery, but also there are times when we don't necessarily want to go on a Thursday night or whatever other night it is for other churches and go to a group called Celebrate Recovery, but we do have hurts and habits and hang-ups. Why? Because we're people. So of course we have hurts and habits and hang-ups. So just going through this series might be able to highlight some of those things in our lives and just help us to understand ourselves a little bit better that, okay, we might not need to go to Thursday night, but we need to self-examine all the time, not just as people, but as Christians. That's something we should do. The Thursday night group is great. There are people that will love you, hold you accountable. There are people to worship with, and there's people to talk to. So there's a lot of value to that too. And what we've been doing is we've been going through the eight principles that they use in Celebrate Recovery. And it's kind of an acrostic of recovery, R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y. I'm going to give you a quick refresher on what those stand for. The first one being R, realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Matthew 5, 3, happy are those who know that they are spiritually poor. You see these eight principles are based on the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. The E stands for earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him and that he has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn for they should be comforted, Matthew 5, 4. The C stands for consciously choose to commit all of my life into Christ's care and control. Happy are the meek, Matthew 5, 5. The O is openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, 8. The V is voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants me to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires, Matthew 5, 6. The second E, evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others when possible, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy are the merciful. Happy are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 7 and 5, 9. The R is reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, for Bible reading, for prayer, in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his will. And then the why is to yield myself to God, to be used to bring his good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. Matthew 5.10. So there was an Eskimo fisherman who came to town every afternoon on a Saturday. He brought his two dogs. One of them was a black dog, another was a white dog, and he had taught them to fight on command. And every Saturday afternoon in the town square, people would gather and these two dogs would fight and the fishermen would take bets. On one Saturday, the white dog would win. On another Saturday, the black dog would win. No one knew which dog was going to win, but you can be sure that the fishermen always won. And after a while, his friend began to wonder what was going on. And he said to the man, how do you do that? How do you predict so carefully and so accurately which dog is going to win? And he said, I starve one and I feed the other. <laughs> the one that I feed always wins because he has more, or well, he's stronger, he has more power. So this story about two dogs, not that I'm endorsing dog fighting at all because it's a disgusting thing, but this story outlines something that happens to us when we become Christians, something that happens to us when we're born again. We begin to get this inner warfare. Billy Graham said, we have two natures within us, both struggling for mastery. Which one will dominate us? It depends on which one we feed. If we feed our spiritual lives and allow the Holy Spirit to empower us, he will rule over us. If we starve our spiritual natures and instead feed the old sinful nature, then the flesh will dominate. Lee Strobel collects corrections from newspapers. He says that sometimes the corrections are even funnier than the original bloopers. One said, in a recent article, we referred to the chairman of the Chrysler Corporation as Lee Lakuku. That was incorrect. His real name is Lee Lakaka. <laughs> it's actually Lakoka, if you're not sure. 
What these people are trying to do when they put these corrections is to make right something that they did wrong. They're trying to correct something that they've wronged, and that's what the next step is in the road to recovery. They're, they're doing relational repair work, which is what we need to do in our lives going back and trying to repair some of the damage that others have done to us and some of the damage that we've done to others. And that's the second E in the acrostic recovery. Evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who've hurt me, and make amends for the harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. And this is based on Ephesians 4, uh, verse 31 and 32. It says, get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. This step obviously has two parts to it. First, forgive those that have hurt me. This is part one and we're going to cover that today. The second part is to, for, to make amends with those that I've hurt. And Tim will do that in a couple of weeks because next week is the 50th anniversary. So we're going to deal with those who have hurt you and those who you have hurt. We'll be looking at why. Why do we need to take this step? And how do we do it? So we'll start with the first part. I am to forgive those who have hurt me. Why? Why do we need to do that? Well, the first reason is because God has forgiven us. And if God has forgiven us, then we should forgive other people. Corinthians says, or Colossians, sorry, says, never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And when I remember how much God has forgiven me, it makes it a whole lot easier to forgive other people. You will never have to forgive anyone more than God has had to forgive you. I will never have to forgive anyone more than God has had to forgive me. And when we have a hard time forgiving other people, it's because we don't feel forgiven. Because people who feel forgiven find it very easy to forgive other people, but people who feel unforgiven have a tough time doing it. If we realize that God has forgiven us, then we need to forgive other people. The second why we should forgive others is because resentment just doesn't work. It's unreasonable, it's unhealth, unhelpful, and it's unhealthy. Job 5.2 said, to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. It's foolish. He said it's foolish because it's illogical and it's unreasonable. Does resentment ever cause people to do stupid things? Absolutely it does. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you are so angry with someone, you're holding so much resentment that you find yourself doing things in life to try and solve that? You go out of your way to do things... And then you stop and say, what am I doing? Why am I going down this road? It's not good. I'm too busy trying to get back at people. It's like shooting yourself so that you hit someone else when the gun recoils. It just doesn't work. You always end up hurting yourself more than you hurt other people. Ecclesiastes 6.9 says, it's foolish to harbor a grudge. It's irrational. It's a waste of energy. It's unreasonable. Job 18.4 18, says, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. And it's unhelpful. Why is it unhelpful? Because we hurt ourselves more than we hurt anybody else. When we get angry and so resentful towards somebody, we're not hurting them. They don't even know about it most of the time. We're sitting there worrying and stewing and spewing over all these different things. We're getting upset about it. But it's not bothering them. They don't know we're doing that. Somebody may have hurt you 10, 20, 30 years ago and was still holding resentment about it. Still making us miserable. But trust me, they've forgotten about it. They may not even have known it was there in the first place. They're completely unaware most of the time. Resentment cannot change the past. It cannot correct the problem. It doesn't change a person and it doesn't even hurt that person. It only hurts you. It makes you miserable certainly doesn't make you feel any better. I've never talked to anybody who said to me, I feel so much better now, I'm feeling resentful. <laughs> it's clearing the way for me. Resentment. Bitterness just makes us mad, and bitterness just makes us unhappy. Some of the most unhappy people I know are people that are holding a grudge. They keep revisiting it. It's unreasonable and it's unhelpful. 
Job 21 says, some men stay healthy till the day they die. Others have no happiness at all. They live and they die with bitter hearts. It's also unhealthy. Research has shown that the unhealthiest emotion that we can have, the most unhealthy emotions, is resentment. Because it's like a cancer that eats us alive. It's poison. It has also physical consequences. You've heard the expression, you might have said it yourself, this guy is a real pain in the neck, or whatever else. <laughs> but he might physically actually be the reason for the pain in your neck, because sometimes there are physical consequences. A guy walks into a doctor and says, I need some pills for my colitis. And the doctor says, who are you colliding with now? <laughs> because resentment can literally manifest itself in physical ways. Dr. S. I. Macmillan wrote a book that showed that the two greatest causes of physical problems, two greatest causes of physical problems, is guilt and resentment. He said it's not so much what you eat, it's what eat you, what eats you that matters. When you're resentful, it just makes you unhealthy. It has physical consequences. It also has emotional consequences. It can lead to depression. It can lead to additional stress. It can lead to fatigue. Depression, additional stress, fatigue. It sounds like one of those drug commercials where they're giving you all the side effects of the drug. Well, these are the side effects of resentment. Because nothing drains us emotionally as bitterness. Thinking about that person, that former girlfriend, former boyfriend, former spouse, the teacher that just made you feel embarrassed, the parent who, who never told, told you that they loved you, the person that you were dating that dropped off the planet without telling you what happened. We hold all that in. We hold it in our hearts. And it drains our body of energy. It prolongs the hurt. It's kind of like a long, drawn-out emotional suicide. We need to forgive those that hurt us. Why? Not for their sake, but for our own sake. The third reason we need to forgive is also because we will need forgiveness in the future. Trust me, I'm going to need forgiveness in the future. It's not like it's all done and passed. Mark 11.25 says, When you are praying, first forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven can also forgive, forgive your sins. Resentment blocks experiencing God's forgiveness. The Bible says we cannot receive what we're unwilling to give. It's dangerous to pray the part of the Lord's prayer which says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, Lord, forgive me as much as I forgive everybody else. Is that a good thought? Is that a scary thought? I'll only get back what I give. So if I'm not forgiving people, how can I be forgiven? We need to forgive other people because God's forgiven us. We need to forgive other people because resentment doesn't work. We need to forgive other people because we are going to need forgiveness in the future. We don't want to burn the bridge that we're about to walk across. Forgiveness is a two-way street. A guy came up to John Wesley, an English theologian from the 1700s. He came up to him and he said, I will never forgive that person. I could never do it. And John Wesley said, then I hope you never sin, because we all need what we don't want to give. So we don't want to burn the bridge that we're about to walk across. So we've looked at why. Why do we need to forgive? And so it's easy to understand sometimes why we need to sin, but how do we do it? What's the next step? Well, first, we need to reveal our hurt. We need to understand what's hurting us. We need to admit it. Let it out. Face it. Be honest about it. Because it's too easy to be dishonest with ourselves. We cannot get over hurt until we admit what it is that's hurt us. I don't know why, but we don't want to admit at times that the people that we love hurt us. It's almost like this misconception that we cannot be angry with people that we love. That's completely untrue. Just because you can be angry with someone doesn't mean you stop loving them. You can be angry with God, but not stop loving him. He can take it. He's big enough. A pastor was talking to a person one time in counseling, and they said, I forgive my parents. They did the best they could. The more that they talked about it, it became more and more obvious that she had, in fact, not forgiven her parents, and she was still very angry inside. But she said that she had forgiven them. But that's denial. They didn't do the best they could. Our parents didn't do the best they could. We as parents don't do the best we can. Why? Because we're human. 
We're imperfect. Nobody does the best they can. It's just a form of denial that we have. And until she was able to admit that, no, they didn't do the best they could, they treated me in some ways that were wrong and that hurt. And it was only then that she could learn to forgive them. You can't forgive what you don't want to own up to, that people have hurt you in life. So you first reveal your hurt. You admit it. Put it down on paper. And then once we've done that, we can look at all these things, and then we have some options. We can first repress it. That's one of our options. Just repress it. Pretend it never happened. What are we talking about? I don't remember. We can ignore it. Push it out of the way. That works for a little bit, but when you ignore things and push them out of the way, they have this horrible tendency of coming back around and coming in as different conditions or issues in life. Or we can suppress it. We can say, it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. They did the best they could. No, they didn't. Just admit it. We can confess it. We can admit what the hurt was. People say things like, I really want to close that door on my past. I'd like to get closure so that person doesn't have the power to hurt me anymore. And to that we can say, great, that's a great thing. But with, there can be no closure without disclosure. We must first admit it. And then we must reveal it. And we must open up and say, that hurt. And it was wrong, and it hurt me. So what do we do? How do we do that? We make a list of those that has harmed us. list of people in our lives who have harmed us, that we feel resentment towards. And we write down what they said, what they did to us, what they thought. And we can put it down on paper as we get it down in black and white. Why do we want to get it black and white? Because sometimes in our brain, lists and things like that can be very fuzzy. It's hard to tell what we're really thinking. It's easily distracted. You get halfway through this, something happens, you're not thinking anymore. But now you put it down on paper and it's all outlined right there in black and white. It makes it much more tangible, much more manageable. We can think about the teacher who embarrassed us in class. We can think about the parent who said, you'll never amount to anything, you're a failure. We can think about the former relationship that was unfaithful and caused it to collapse. We can write it down and reveal it in our heart. And then what you do second is you release the offender. I release my offender, I let them go, I'm not going to think about it anymore, I'm stop holding on to the hurt. How do I do that? How do I release my offender? You have to forgive them. It's the only way that you can release them. You have to forgive them. We don't wait for them to ask for forgiveness. We do it whether they ask for forgiveness or not, because ultimately it's not for them, it's for us. Why? Because God has forgiven us, and resentment doesn't work in our lives. And at some point in the future, we're going to need forgiveness too. I had an occasion to do this. When I had a business, I had somebody in my business who decided that they were going to break away from me, take away all the tools that I needed to do that, take them for themselves and start up on their own with another partner. And literally my income dropped by a third overnight. They took everything that I needed and set it up on their own. And I, at the time, I just happened to be going to Thursday morning Bible study. And we were doing a study called Simplify by Bill Hybels. And in Simplify, Bill talks about the same thing, that we need to let go of these things in our lives, that they become a prison and that they just help hold us back from moving forward unless we can resolve them. And the way to resolve it was to forgive the people in our lives that were holding us back. So I did exactly that. I called him up and I went and had lunch with him. And I told him that I needed to forgive him. Now, things don't always go the way you expect them to in these situations. <laughs> Because he looked at me, and I, I knew that look. It was like, for what? He didn't feel like he needed forgiveness. He didn't even feel like, he felt like he was justified in everything that he had done. But it didn't matter. And that's the point. And that's the beautiful thing about it. It didn't matter anymore because at that point, I felt nothing about it anymore. I'd forgiven him, whether he wanted it or not, or whether he felt he needed it or not. And I was free. I was free of that resentment. <laughs> So we release our offender and we forgive them for our, our own sake, not for theirs. A number of years ago at Saddleback Church, there was a lady named Judy who was going through a very bitter divorce. And on top of that, the high stress of divorce, her sight, her eyesight was also failing in one eye. 
So her eye began to deteriorate. She went down to the Scripps Institute and checked it out. And they said, it's deteriorating, and I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do to help you. She was carrying all of this resentment and all of this bitterness from her divorce. And then one day she walked into Saddleback Church and was sitting there in the service, and Pastor Rick was speaking about resentment. And he said, for your own sake, you've got to let it go. For your own sake, you have to release your offenders, no matter what they've done. Don't allow people in your past to continue to hurt you in the present through resentment. Let it go. And I know right now in your heads, a lot of people, there's this song going around. (laughs) Disney. (laughs) She bowed her head and said, God, I reveal my hurt and I release my offender. I let them go. She walked out of the church and she walked across the patio and her eyesight came back. She said, she went back to Scripps and they said, this is a miracle. You were blind in that eye. When she let go of her resentment, and we talked about physical results from resentment, God said, I want to do a miracle in your life. And you have no idea of what can happen in your life when you let go of people that have been hurting you, let go of the people that have been holding you back. But how often do we have to forgive people? Well, what does Jesus say? How many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And Jesus answered, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Or in some versions, it's 77. Depends on what version you have. But the point is, it's not the exact number. It's not 490 times, so you can count. It just means eternally, infinity. You never stop forgiving. Because those feelings are going to keep coming back over and over again. And every time you feel those feelings, you've got to forgive again. Forgiveness is not a one-shot deal. It's it's a repeated issue. It's not something that you just say, okay, I forgive him and move on. Jesus said, do it over and over. And how do you know when to stop? When you've released them fully. It may take 300 times. Who knows? But how do you know when you've released them fully? Well, you don't think about them in the same way anymore. When you think about a person that used to embody rage in you, Now you can think about them and not think that anymore. You don't feel the resentment. In fact, you might find yourself praying for God's blessing on them. You can begin to to look how to understand their hurt. Because ultimately, when you get hurt by people, there is something that we should understand, is that hurt people hurt people. There is more than likely hurt in their lives. So you begin to understand their hurt, and that's when you have a chance to release them. You keep forgiving them, keep forgiving them, until finally it doesn't hurt anymore. How do you forget a nasty divorce? You don't. You don't forget it. But you can get rid of the pain. You can get rid of the resentment. You just have to let go of it. In releasing an offender, it's not always possible. And sometimes it's not always a good idea to go back to the person that offended you. The circumstances may have changed. Maybe your parents hurt you many years ago and they didn't even realize it. If they ever knew about it, it would just blow them away. You come back 40 years later and say, you did this to me and it really hurt me and affected my life. They may have been completely unaware of it. Some people have changed. Some people have remarried. Some people have moved away and you have no idea where they went. Some people have passed away and you don't have the opportunity. So what do you do in those kinds of situations? Well, there's an exercise that some people call the empty chair. Where you take a chair, you put it in front of you, then you sit in another chair, and you imagine the person that you want to talk to sitting in that chair in front of you. And then you just lay it all out there. You say, you hurt me this way, or this way, or this way, but I want, you to, I want to forgive you because God forgave me, because resentment doesn't work in my life, and because in the future I'm going to need forgiveness too. I am releasing you. You just literally say it to the chair. Another way to do it is to write a letter but you're never going to mail this letter. Just write it down. This is how you hurt me. Lay it all out there. You unload it. You've been carrying it so long, you just need to unload it onto paper. And at the end, you say, but starting today, I forgive you. Why? Because God forgave me, and resentment doesn't work in my life, and I'm going to need forgiveness in the future. You do it for your own sake. You release them and experience the freedom. Then you burn the letter. Forgiveness doesn't make the other person right. It makes you free. That's in the power of praying as a book. The third way to do it is replace my hurt with God's peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in my heart. But doesn't that seem unfair? If I forgive people, they get away scot-free with what they did. No, they don't. Let God settle it. 
he can do a whole lot better job of settling the score than we can. The Bible says one day God is going to settle the score. He's going to call into accounts. He's going to balance the books. And one day he is going to have the last word. So let God have the last word on this matter. He'll take care of it. He's the judge. That's why we believe in hell. Jesus mentioned hell more than heaven. Because if there is no hell, then people like Hitler got away with it, scot free. And that would be unfair. But God is a fair God. The Bible says there will be judgment. So you just release them, and in the meantime, you focus on God's peace rather than how to get even. Let the peace rule in your heart. Relationships can tear our hearts to pieces, rip them apart. But Jesus has the capability of covering our hearts with his peace, covering our pieces with his peace. So we need to release those who hurt us so God can do some repair in our hearts. I'll close with this story. On February the 9th, 1960, Adolf Kors III, the millionaire head of the Kors Company, was kidnapped and held for ransom. Seven months later, his body was found on a hillside and he'd been shot to death. Now, Adolf Kors IV, who was then 15 years old, had not just lost his father, but also he'd lost his best friend. And for years, Adolf Kors IV hated Joseph Corbett the man who had been sentenced to life in prison for killing his father. In 1975, almost 15 years later, Kors became a Christian. Yet his hatred for Corbett, the murderer of his dad, still consumed him. Now Kors knew that he needed to forgive Corbett as Jesus Christ had forgiven him. So he visited the maximum security prison in Colorado's Cannon City to talk with Joseph Corbett, but Corbett wouldn't visit with him. So Kors left Corbett a Bible and the following note. I'm here to see you today as I'm sorry that we, and I'm sorry that we could not meet. As a Christian, I'm summoned to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to forgive. I do forgive you. And I ask you to forgive me for the hatred that I've been holding against you for so many years. And then later Kors confessed, I have a love for that man that only Jesus Christ could have put in my heart. Because our heart is made whole when we forgive through Jesus Christ. Our heart is being perfected as we express the forgiveness that God gave us and we in turn must give to others. So how do we feel about the way our heart is? Who comes to mind when we think about resentment? What comes into our mind? What face appears? And what are we going to do about it? We need to examine our heart. Lay it all out there. Put it on paper. Talk to an empty chair. But get it out and let it go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for the lesson that we can learn through this. The understanding that we can't hold resentment and that the other people don't know that we're holding resentment against them and frankly they don't care. So Lord, help us to let it go. Help us to cast away all of this resentment and all of this bitterness because it only helps us. Resentment doesn't do us any good. We can be free. And we just pray that we will follow the example that was given to us. Your example. You forgive us and so in turn we need to forgive others. How can we be forgiven unless we give what we want? Lord, we just ask you to bless this day and this week. And we pray this in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ. Amen.